Hello everyone. For today's episode of Saturdays, I'm going to be looking at some autism songs. Why? Well, as of recording this, it is Autism Month, which is a month to raise acceptance for people on the autistic spectrum. I say acceptance because, well, the thing about awareness is that suggests it's kind of like a disease rather than just a different type of personality set. And I'd rather view it as a personality-related thing than necessarily something that needs to be cured or otherwise. Not that we could, as it's a neurological-related condition that starts at birth and continues on to this till they die. So, as a result, I wanted to look at some autism songs that are kind of sad in nature and maybe take the time to kind of respond to them accordingly. Well, I'm not a psychologist by trade, nor do I have any such degrees. I just, I did spend a lot of free time reading books that pertain to people on the spectrum, whether it was autobiographies on them or parenting books on how to care for them. I also have a bachelor's degree in business administration and computer information systems, and I've written five books at this time that have been alive, albeit short novellas mostly. And through feedback from people who have read them and trial and error, I've come to understand the importance of choosing the right words to say in any given situation and how they affect others. I'm not perfect at it, and sometimes I find myself unintentionally offending at times, especially online or in text forms, or perhaps in real life if I say something that sounds good at the time but I reflect back later in facepalm. I am also, whether it be a shock to anyone, on the autistic spectrum. I was diagnosed with Asperger's somewhere between 4th and 6th grade, and even before then it was known I had special needs, but they just couldn't put a firm diagnosis on me until then because I didn't exhibit some of the stereotypical autism behaviors such as hand flapping or, you know, things of that nature. I didn't go or anything like that. No offense to anybody who does. I mean, that's, uh, you know, but that's unfortunately all they were looking for at the time, you know, to diagnose the condition for the most part. And I didn't have any of the obvious. But that didn't stop them from prescribing medications for things like ADHD, depression, maybe psychosis, things of that nature. And so bear in mind, this is between like 1995 and 2002. We've come a long way since then, and I was in Covina, California, so they may or may not have been behind the curve. I'm not sure. I, I didn't grow up in any of the other places in California, so I, I don't know how they would have stacked up at the time. And when I was 23, I got diagnosed with pervasive developmental disorder, not otherwise specified. And that was on the reasoning that I was too social to be someone with Asperger's, but I still had some neurological difficulties, such as in the fine motor skills category with tying shoes, writing legibly and cursive. I know I'm a scribe, ironic, Ugh. but anyway. And sometimes reading the room was a bit difficult. I mean, if there's one thing I could say about myself that's pretty accurate, I'm fairly consistent with how I talk to people, which can be a problem depending on what crowd you are. And while I've gotten better at kind of reading the room, I want to say, to the extent that it's a, my condition is personality-based, I haven't changed all that much from what I remember myself being. Just maybe... I mean, I still live to create harmony because I've always been kind of a people pleaser by nature, knowing I'm different and wanting to always be in people's good graces. And, uh, I also have difficulties with taking a bit longer to assess a, a situation unfolding in front of me, or if I'm faced with a situation where I don't know how to handle it for some reason or another. I might panic and then just completely, well, for lack of a better word, melt down. And um, some of you may have caught um, my first or second set 
Sad Your Days um, episode where I was reading New Life, New Strife, and I read that fourth chapter with the horror going on in their dream world. Well, those kinds of negative thoughts are more or less what, what reel around my head, and I get lost in them, and my awareness of everything around me starts to kind of gradually fade away, and my mind is just reeling and spiraling. And so you could say my brain is, in a way, a psychological horror show. <laughs> and, uh, while in that state, I may see people looking worried around me and, and think that they're afraid of me somehow. And so, and so that kind of feeds into that whole, you're a monster that needs to die if the world is to be safe. But I'll elaborate on that a little bit more with Monster Mondays when I analyze some of the characters such as the one that was in that story and, and other characters I've created that are around different aspects of being on the spectrum, whether I intended to or not. It's hard not to write what you know. And some of these characters are canonical to my novels. Others I've just kind of been playing around with as mostly concept works in Telegram at this time. Now, now that I've explained more or less the background from which I'm assessing the videos today, I should inform you I, I may end up getting a copyright claim for any any sounds or, or clips I may feature in this video. And I no way claim ownership of said materials, nor do I intend to take away from the fact that being a parent is hard in the best of circumstances. And I'm in no way intending to attack anyone in the videos or review when I critique them, nor do I wish any harm to come of anyone involved. My purpose is to analyze the lyrics for accuracy to what autism is based on research on it and any insight I may have in being on the spectrum as well. You can find the source videos in the description. Okay, so for our first video, we're looking at an autism song called When the Children Cry by Flatline, official compound film. And I wrote an interesting poem in response to this a year ago that I played on my original channel, and I plan to reprise it for, reprise it for Writer Wednesdays this week. And I'm selling it on my website. I have a direct link to the product in the description below. And below the source videos, and for the entire month of April 2021, I'm going to take all the money from the purchases that didn't go to shipping costs and donate it to Autism Self-Advocacy Network as my gift to the greater autism community of which I'm a part. I checked the Charity Navigator and did my due diligence to find they're one of the best charities out there for autism acceptance, which is what I advocate strongly. Obviously, you'd be doing better by donating directly to them, but I'm unsure what sort of gifts they would offer to you for doing so. And for those that want to both do good and have something to show for it, I'd be happy to supply that accordingly. Now, on to the video itself. It starts out well enough using a clip of a woman explaining the amount of people affected by autism, and that just because you know one child with autism, it means you you know one child with autism. It should also be noted that this song is about a non-speaking person on the spectrum, and while assistive technology now exists to help some people, I'm unsure how affordable it is and who qualifies to receive it, and where one could even acquire it. So even though this video was made seven years ago at least, it's still possible that such vital technology wasn't affordable to those of low income at the time. And here's a little preview of that. And so as you can see, you know, it starts off with that clip, and then you hear the when the children cry and the new world begins. Already you can start to see that this is a very sad, you know, narrative that's about to be portrayed here. And that's where it got its place in the sadder days, whereas I might have otherwise added it in, say, Writer Wednesday, rather. 
And so you'll hear just a couple lines of that song, then Flatline will begin singing how excited he was to have a son on the spectrum, and how he played with his child like any parent would. The son was apparently diagnosed at two years old, and despite otherwise negative feelings on the situation at hand, he has to stay strong for the family. It's also interesting to note how he uses the words, when you look into my eyes, I know that you love me. Let's continue and hear that. Now, why is that line interesting? Well, people on the spectrum, I mean, not all of them, but enough of them that it's been documented in many a textbooks and educational materials. Nonverbal communication can be a big challenge, especially the ones that are pretty good at speaking. I mean, you might notice that I'm kind of struggling to, to look between the script and the camera right now and still keep on track. You know, that's something that I've I've worked through for years and with mixed results. And uh, they're the type that their eyes tend to wander when talking to you or or just feel like it's too much to look you in the eye. It's it's not it's not against you, you know, it's it could be some sort of anxiety they might have towards talking to others or they might find it difficult to both focus on your emotions and what they were trying to tell you at the same time. It's kind of that multitasking thing, in a way. You know, not not everybody's good at it. Moving on. This isn't in the script, but um, if you actually go view the, the source material, you might also notice that it, while he's singing, or there are notes on the screen that say things like boys are nearly five times more likely than girls to have autism. Not untrue. You notice how you've reassured his son that while others may stare in judgment, they'll always, he'll always be by the, his side, which is truly touching. And despite these challenges, his teachers help him see, will help him see his potential, or so he believes. Now, the reason I, I thought above that maybe those things weren't affordable to him is, you know, goes to a, a line that's a little further in the song. Now, that was a lot to unpack, so let me try and digest that for you a little bit. So while it seemed all lovey-dovey at first with, you know, with them being like, man, I wish people would help us out, you know, the government's fighting all these wars domestically. This is why I thought maybe, you know, the assistive technology might not have been readily available 
because um, there weren't grants involved that that let people of specific incomes get it for free or for next to nothing. And so if you unfortunately didn't have parents who could afford the latest, you know, tech with respect to, they have these devices now where you can, at the very least, train your kid to express emotions through it. There's, and there's like an app that comes with it. You get this tablet, they can hit it and it says happy, sad, angry, things like that. There's even ones that go a step further and let them actually type out their thoughts, even if they can't speak it. And so stuff like that would have been probably cutting edge seven years ago and, and probably still fairly sophisticated even now. I would have to check the market to see what those go for, but yeah, I don't imagine anybody who's struggling financially could afford it at the time. So that's where when he mentioned, you know, that they're not helping them, you know, the government, maybe that is what he's conveying here. Then you probably, then you probably heard, you know, the whole part about how, you know, all the fight and all the crying wouldn't change it for the world. Your brothers wonder why you don't talk to him. And so that's the hint that he might be non-speaking because Typically, if we can speak, we will, if, if prodded enough. And the unfortunate truth is, what I think drives a lot of people angry, especially if they can't speak in a way we understand, or even if they can speak, but people don't just seem to get it. You know, the biggest thing is being misunderstood. We feel like, well, heck, you know, we're, we're some alien from another planet, and none of these people speak our language. They don't understand what it's like. They don't know what it's what it is to have a head that's constantly firing off all these concepts and stuff. But how do we tell them? How do we say it in a way they'll understand? And so, it kind of goes to what something I learned in customer service, where you know, regardless of what a person's condition is, typically when when they start getting upset, angry demanding or otherwise, it, it comes from a place of need or perceived need. That is, let's say you got a person who, you know, you forgot a burger in his order because he had this huge order that's like, I want to say almost $50 in, in California money, you know, to get. So it's got like four or five different things and, or maybe you're just taking too long to make something. And then he's like, hurry up already, you know, and getting all, you know, stern and nasty and mean and everything you know it, it comes from a place of a perceived need while they don't necessarily need a hamburger they do need to eat and so by understanding that it helps to depersonalize things a bit and i figure likewise in kind it's possible that some people on the spectrum might not have the same filter that you would like them to have and or you know maybe there are times when because they didn't, they forgot a piece of their self-care, their mind is only on one specific thing, and never mind what else is going on. So it comes off as selfish, it comes off as rude, it comes off as mean, it comes off as anything but nice, but it's probably not what they want in the long run, but at the time, it's just that instinct going on right there. And then, you know, that causes that spiral of, oh, heck, how am I to fix this? Everything's going horribly wrong. I'm a monster. I should die. You know, that type of thing. And so that's where I think, you know, the need to speak, you know, that's why some that can't speak will behave erratically to the, to the perception of others or in ways that just seem destructive or counterintuitive to what they should be doing. And so you might be like, okay, well, big deal. You know, well, I'll ask you this, if, if we're all going to die someday, and we know, and we know that, why do we bother forming relationships if there isn't some sort of need for companionship in it all? Would we not be better off just never making friends, talking to anyone, just living isolated, save for the essentials? I'm not saying that we actually should live like that, but instead, I'm trying to strengthen the idea that our woes in life and strife does in fact come from a place of perceived need or actual need in many cases. So that's why I think that's what's happening with that. 
And so, being unable to speak, they feel dismissed, you know, people walk past them, they just, they might stare at them, like, what the heck? Or whatnot. So, yeah, Flatline's good. He says, good to the point out that, hey, look what he's achieved. But then it gets, at about the three minute mark, it gets to that line you just heard a few minutes ago, but probably forgotten with all the rambling I've done right now, which is, you can vaccinate your child, but it's strictly your decision. Unfortunately, to vaccinate is not the sort of thing that only affects your child, but the children of many others, including those two ammonia compromised to get it themselves. So while, well, yeah, I, I agree you shouldn't kill your child by getting them a vaccine if their immune system can't handle it, unless you have a way to know your child is of that, which, you, which usually you are if you consent to the regiment in the first place, you should make every attempt to get them vaccinated for diseases that have no cure but can only be prevented via vaccines, which means if you can get them vaccinated, do it. You know, if they're immunocompromised, then no, don't, don't kill, and you know it, no, don't kill them, no. Seriously, don't. But for those that can, they absolutely should, if only to protect those vulnerable populations. Unfortunately, because of such people as Dr. Wakefield, toppled with, you know, parents desperate for answers, you know, how something like this could happen to their children, probably more so in non-speaking than speaking people on the spectrum. I can totally see that. It creates an environment where conspiracy theories can go from amusing and harmless to deadly fast. And this is a problem I don't see disappearing anytime soon unless people can learn to critically think and question everything. Which, and then the song goes back to when the children cry and then, you know, you'll see that, that while it may be a little premature to just jump to that, I'll explain in just a minute. Okay, now that was a lot to take, and um, and so you might have heard the part about the whole there's mercury in the vaccines, which is one of the many worries that anti-vax parents have about vaccinating their children. It should, however, be noted that all reputable sources will tell you the amount of mercury in a vaccine is less than you'd find in fish. And so if they're really worried about mercury, I really hope they're not letting their kids eat fish. <laughs> then he goes into a narrative that resembles one of Autism Speaks early narratives that autism pulls families apart. And to that I say no. As many others who have tackled the topic before, blaming the condition for the problems in the family does not help anyone. No one asks to be born as we are, and while yes, there are annoying aspects to all people, that's not unique to people on the autistic spectrum. Then he goes on about lack of funding, special education, no help for the poor. He uses the word cure as though it is a disease. And goes back to talking about how much he loves his child very much and apparently wrote the song to the fact he's not alone in the struggle. Then the video outro is to more of the Children Cry song. And while I can totally understand where there may be lack of funding for people who need it in low-income areas, and I will concede that to be a fact since schools are funded by property owners and their taxes. I even went to a school that had such budgetary issues growing up, maybe not as extreme as his, but According to my parents, they said, we can't afford to accommodate him, even though the law made it compulsory. Where I take issue is 
when he brings up the cure aspect. As I and others on the spectrum and off of it, who know what we're talking about, will tell you, you cannot cure a disorder. It is with you from birth until death, and one would be wise to support people who, instead of hemorrhaging money looking for a cure that can never be found, should instead look for ways to work with the condition, not against it. So I guess to make a long review short, if the one who wrote this song is watching this, I understand your song was written from a place of love for your child, and I'm not here to take that away from you. I only want to attempt to clear the air around some misinformation that people, regardless of economic standing, may be exposed to. A richer middle-class family is just as susceptible to desperation for answers that can lead them down a dark and misguided path as one not so fortunate. In other words, the road to hell is paved with good intentions. With that out of the way, I hope, regardless of everything, them and their child are doing well. So let's listen to that last little outro. Oh, Autism Song by Flatline, When the Children Cry, compilation. Now for this next one, since that one was fairly, well, depressing as all hell, and fairly tinfoil hat conspiracy theory towards the end there, I want to look at something that was made by someone who's actually on the spectrum. According to what I'm seeing here, She's known as Emily Burke. She's got 499 subscribers now. And she wrote a song to explain what it's like to live with autism and how lonely it can be sometimes. It was made on April 30th, 2010. You'll see the link to it in the description below as well. It starts off with the lines, life with autism can be lonely and, and things of that nature. But I think I'll let the song speak for itself without interruption on this one.
was positively beautiful and I couldn't have really conveyed it any better myself, you know. And, uh, okay, so now that we've gone through the entire video, I thought it interesting to note that she inspires hope that if people know how to handle one of this condition, we can do a lot of good for many, and that any bad we do isn't intended to hurt a person more often than not, despite how much it may seem so at times. Sometimes we can just get overwhelmingly frustrated and cannot keep a filter on it. It's one of those songs that is so well done, I hardly know what to say about it, as it pretty much sums up the truth beautifully and presents it in a way someone who's lived it can. So for our next video, we'll get by by Johnny Orband. was We'll Get By by the Johnny Orr Band. And thankfully for me, he had um, lyrics in his description, so it was a lot easier to kind of write responses to this without having to listen to the videos over and over. And so, 
One thing that probably stood out to you immediately was that his kid likes playing by himself and at school. And it's highly possible to not necessarily be a brilliant child, but still like school. I personally didn't, but I can't know what sort of education he received. He also mentions that autism is like a prison, and at times it can be when a person on the spectrum is expected by the rest of society to function as they do. Unfortunately, it's not that simple. Even I must make a conscious effort to watch my breathing and make sure I've had enough to eat and decent enough sleep, not to overdose some caffeine, and all that just to make sure I'm at my absolute best every single day of the week. And at times I can feel like I'm not myself, or that I, that being myself, you know, all that I am, just won't fly in, in mainstream society, or wherever I happen to be. And, and then there's that part where he mentions not wanting to be loved, but the timing of it. And that everything within them, and that it takes everything within them to make it through without a fight. It's true that we may or may not express joy for others as one might expect, and it's not necessarily out of envy. Just to someone like me, it can be a lot to try to both process the feeling the person has, what triggered it, and what does it mean for the person in the long run. That is, I tend to be more left brain dominant. That is, I'm trying to think of the implications of the issue rather than feeling it instantly. And that can sometimes lead me to come off as cold, uncaring, or otherwise. But really, it, it might just be that I'm trying to process, you know, okay, this person's feeling excited. Sounds like something great has happened. What happened? What does it mean? What's going on? It's also important to know that a lot of us have been conditioned through school or their sources not to be too wild, and it can be hard to balance between hyper-excited and happy or indifferent, but supportive. As for the timing of the love and making it without a fight, it pretty much goes along with what I said about having to make a conscious effort to keep oneself together and to respond appropriately to things. It can be annoying to get interrupted from for anything, no matter if it's good or bad. Then we get to the lines that show self-awareness that, yeah, the child probably sees them crying, the parents are aware of it, and they pray for healing that one day he won't be that way. This is the part where I have a mixed feelings, because autism isn't something that can be cured, and I'm not one to advocate for praying it away. But I can say that to some extent, some of the issues of being on the spectrum get better with therapy and age over time, so there's hope for that. And in other words, as one grows older and matures, has time to see the world change, and change with it, any issues that come with the condition seem to be more and more normal. So, all things considered a nice song and significantly less misinformed than the lyrics in the first one, from how it's coming off. Now, what I mean is, you'd think it unusual for a child to talk at length about any one thing, you know, that they might be interested in. They used to call it little professor syndrome in a way. And such characters can often be seen in media like Sheldon Cooper from The Big Bang Theory, just to name one. Or in other cases, they're that unapologetic guy that knows everything, or girl, or however it or non-binary, or however it happens to be. But that's only part of the story. The truth is, you know, there's, it's a spectrum, so there's plenty in between. We're not necessarily all ah about everything. But simultaneously, not all of us quite make it to the unapologetic, unempathetic, you know, smart guy archetype either. I would consider myself somewhere in between that, in, in that sense. So, it's not so much that one is cured of their condition if they outgrow some, seem to outgrow some aspects of it, or those aspects seem to be more like what one would expect of someone that age. It's still there, but I like to think that as we get older, like anything else, we learn to live with it, we learn to find ways around it, we get, we get the strategies that um, we're supposed to get sooner or later. 
And I surmise at the end of the day, awareness videos will always hold more of a let's hope it can be cured or this person healed, while acceptance videos will usually be asking more how can they work with the unique things that come of it. Regardless of which school of thought you may lean towards, it's important to understand the implications of both sides of the issue if one wants to be an effective advocate. I hope this video was informative and hopefully engaging as well. And I thank you for watching, and this has been Sad Your Day, brought to you by the Forsaken Scribe. Thank you.